Good morning and welcome to Holy Spirit Lutheran Church Online. I am Pastor Jim Grazer. I am delighted that you are joining us today. You will notice things look a little different this morning. We are busily preparing for vacation Bible school. Our children arrive tomorrow, and so you will note that our volunteers have been hard at work making this the best experience possible for them. Please remember our volunteers, staff, and uh, all of those children that are going to be coming to us in your prayers that this will be a time that the Spirit moves in those kids and volunteers that all are drawn closer to God through this experience and that they have fun together and form a tremendous attachment to church that will serve them the rest of their lives. A couple other announcements that I do want to share with you this morning. We want to remind you about the supplies drive that continues for the matron program in the Village of Hope in Haiti. That supplies list is available not only at our church office, but especially online. And you can go to our webpage and locate that list and find what we need donated. And then our His Kids Children's Ministry will be assembling those packets that we will then send to Village of Hope for them to use with new moms and new babies in that community. We also want to remind you that it's hard to imagine school is two weeks away from starting in Palm Beach County. And so to make sure our kids are adequately prepared for the school year, we want to bless their backpacks on Sunday morning, August 8th at the 9.30 a.m. worship service. So you are welcome to bring your child and your child's backpack to worship that morning at the very beginning of worship is when we will do that backpack blessing. Also, we'd love to encourage you if you are a teacher or a school county employee and would like to uh, receive a blessing as well, we would have uh, a lot of fun if you could participate in that with us. So, mark your calendar for Sunday, August 8th, the 9.30 a.m. worship service for the backpack blessing. With those announcements, we continue with our worship. Hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see ha! How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.
Have you ever shown up to a class or event at HSLC and thought, wow, this space is set up just the way I need it? Or have you ever wondered who set everything back up after the last event before church on Sunday? Our beautiful and functional campus is an amazing blessing to our ministries, and that is why it's important to maintain our facilities. This is no easy task, but our property team is ready for the job. Dave Nelson and Troy Maddox are hard at work helping us to prepare for whatever ministry activities we have on campus. The most important and time-consuming part of the job is making sure everything is running smoothly. If you don't see the property team, it means they are doing their jobs well. It may not be the most exciting work that happens at the church, but without their efforts maintaining our facilities, we would be at a loss when something goes wrong. From setting up chairs or coordinating with vendors, our team does an outstanding job of making sure HSLC is always ready to serve when needed. We'd like to give a great big thank you to Dave Nelson and Troy Maddox for all your hard work at HSLC. The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 and 11 through 16. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This ends the reading. Good morning, and please pray with me. God, we give you thanks that you gather us together as your church, and then you pour out your spirit to equip us to become the people you need to serve the world. We'd ask that you would come now, enter into this time, open our ears and our hearts to how you plan to equip us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we continue with part two of our sermon series about what I think it means to be the church. Last week we talked about gathering as God's people, this week, we are focusing on what is supposed to happen while we are gathered together. I'm calling this equipping. The whole reason we are gathered and collected is to be equipped to do ministry. I hope you notice the equipment room sign on the door of our worship space this morning. We could actually have that on any door to any room on our campus because it's my hope that whenever we gather here, Equipping you for ministry is what happens. When our youth ministries, his kids, and soul fire gather, I hope some kind of equipping for ministry is happening. When any of our small groups gather, I hope some kind of equipping for ministry is happening. When our music teams gather, 
I hope some kind of equipping for ministry is happening. And keeping an eye on our topic for next Sunday's sermon, when I say ministry, I mean the work that we are sent to do out there in the communities in which we live and work and go to school. What happens here on campus isn't only for our sakes, it's for the sake of the world, if you remember what we talked about last week. The reading from Ephesians this morning opens by reminding us that we need to be unified in our mission to the world. We need to understand that this equipping we experience here isn't individualized. It's not focused simply on equipping you to be a better person. I hope that does happen, that you grow in your discipleship as a follower of Jesus. But, church, it isn't about you. It's about us. It's about making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, as Paul writes. This equipping is team building, not person building. At verse 11, Paul talks about varieties of gifts, but they are for the benefit of the whole body. A football team of all quarterbacks or of all kickers isn't going to succeed. Every position is necessary. There will be drills and exercises done for the whole team, and then there will be drills and exercises for each position. If you're a quarterback, don't try to be a kicker, and vice versa. But regardless of which one you are, both need to try to be a teammate, a team player. Sir Thomas Beecham was the founder of the London Philharmonic and the Beecham Opera Company. Beecham once traveled to a certain city to appear as the guest conductor. And during the first rehearsal, he quickly noticed that the orchestra was not well-trained. As the rehearsal continued, he became more and more frustrated. Finally, he had to stop the musicians for the third time at the same place in the score. One of the musicians protested, well, just how do you want us to play? And Sir Thomas looked at him and calmly suggested, together. Holy Spirit has a beautiful song to offer the community around us. It's going to require two things. A certain proficiency of skills on each of our parts, a certain level of equipping, and it will require playing the same song, playing together. Unity in the Spirit. And I know this isn't new to you. Holy Spirit has been faithful in regular strategic planning, regular unification. We've been faithful in good communication, keeping everyone on the same page. And Holy Spirit has been clear in addressing individuals who attempt to prioritize their own agendas over the agenda of the organization, over the mission of the church. Here's a little deeper dive on today's reading. At verse 11, Paul identifies gifts given to the community leaders. The particular task of these gifted ones is to equip the saints. My job as pastor and the job of your elected leaders on council is to equip the saints. Our job isn't to do all the ministry on behalf of you. Our job is to equip you, the rest of the team, to do ministry. Equip all of us to be a blessing to the community around us, like we talked about last week. The word equip, Paul uses here, is the same word in Greek that is used of the disciples preparing their nets in Matthew 4, 21. Other versions have the disciples mending their nets, i.e. making them serviceable or useful for the mission ahead. That's precisely the task of those who are pastors and teachers, to equip others, to prepare others, to mend others, or as Paul calls them, the saints. Or in the language of last week's sermon, to be a life-saving station for shipwrecked souls, a group of wounded healers mending others. The object of this equipping is that they might be prepared for ministry, which in turn has as its object building up the body of Christ. And this should continue 
until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. As a gathered people, we are here to build each other up so that we will be able to go out on our life-saving mission. Paul uses a ship metaphor when he continues in the next sentence. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. Being together, we can't be deterred by various and sundry vacation brochures that happen to flutter past our field of vision. We know who we are. We know where we are going. We know why we're doing what we're doing. And we must not be distracted by other things blowing in the wind. Finally, the Christian life is also a caring life. Christians speak the truth in love. In the verses following the text for today, Paul gets even more specific, offering a whole laundry list of examples of how the church is a caring community, not a bitter community or thieving community, and certainly not a group that lives like a gang of Gentiles. He concludes by saying, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger, and wrangling, and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Truly be a team. As an aside, notice that there's no mention here of heaven as the ultimate vacation venue. The church really arrives when it functions fully as the body of Christ and everyone has a stake in the adventure. Christianity is the ultimate group project where togethering is more of a requirement than an option. There's an old story about an old man who's dying and calls his people to his side. He gives a short, sturdy stick to each of his many offspring and relatives. Break the stick, he instructs them, and with no effort, they all snap their sticks in half. This is how it is when a soul is alone without anyone, he tells them. They can easily be broken. Then the old man gives each of his kin another stick and says, this is how I would like you to live after I pass. Put your sticks together in bundles of twos and threes, Now break these bundles in half. No one can break the sticks when there are two or more in a bundle. And the old man smiles. We are strong when we stand with another soul. When we are with another, we cannot be broken. Not only is our togetherness and unity a wonderful picture of human community that God designed, It is also for our ability to withstand the challenges of ministry, the challenges of acting like the body of Christ in a time in history that isn't always receptive to that. Jesus himself warns us, see, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. The unity of the spirit we are promised is for our provision to withstand whatever may come our way. When we are with each other in unified love, we cannot be broken. When I was on the bishop's staff, one of my jobs was to consult with congregations who had experienced decline and wanted to turn that trend around. I'd often use the image of a personal trainer with those counsels. If you wait until you become a skinny guy to start doing skinny guy things, you'll never get there. You have to behave like a skinny guy in order to become a skinny guy. Start exercising while you're a chubby guy, then you will get skinnier. Start eating what skinny guys eat while you're chubby, and soon you'll get skinnier. You get the point, right? The same is true for churches who want to grow. There are behaviors small churches have that keep them small. If a church wants to grow, it has to behave like the larger church while it is still a small church. It will behave its way into growth. Like people, 
Churches will become what they do, but they can't wait until they become it to start doing it. So us chubby guys often have to work with a personal trainer to get us doing the right behaviors to get skinny, and sometimes the personal trainer has to knock the donut out of our hands if we don't drop it on our own. But we love donuts, right? But the donut isn't going to get me to where I want to be. So the personal trainer lovingly knocks the donut to the floor because he or she is there to help us reach our goals. That's how they equip us. Church leadership is often the same way. Our leaders sometimes have to knock the growth-limiting behaviors out of our hands in order to get us to where we want to be, growing. It is done in love because that's what the organization says it wants to do. That's how church leaders equip us to grow in ministry. Remember last week that I told you this sermon series was a chance to get inside my head and come to understand how I see my job description? My job is to equip you. My responsibility is to have us ready as a church to face the ministry out in our community in 2021 and beyond. Lots of Lutheran churches are still equipping their congregants to do ministry that was effective in 1990 or 1970, or 1950, and as a result, they are shrinking. If there are, if there are any of those 30-year-old-plus vestigial tales still hanging around here, we will have to decide if it's time to get them knocked out of our hands. In other words, are there behaviors we have that no longer make sense and are no longer effective in post-COVID 2021 and beyond. If you're a car manufacturer, does it still make sense to sell cars with cassette players in them, or CD players in them for that matter? Or in the language of today's reading, if we are one body in Christ, if we are Jesus' body, what things would Jesus be doing out in Palm Beach County in 2021? I bet Jesus would be doing different things than he did in 1950. 2021's marginalized people are different than 1970's marginalized people. The tools to reach people now are different than the tools of 1990. It's still net mending and people mending, yes, but the nets and people and tools are different now. Here is some equipping I think we need to be about. Some of it is a continuation of what has been happening, and some of it is new experimentation. There are certain basics to discipleship we must continue. Ongoing study of the scriptures. A Christian never graduates from study, nor do they graduate from prayer. Prayer and scripture study are still absolutely necessary equipment a Christian's need as is worship. Our souls need to worship. Instruction about generosity and sharing of our resources. This has been vital since the church began, and I would argue that churches now have to really be direct about it. The ways church giving used to be taught have been co-opted in this new age. We can't assume anything about what we think people know about generosity. Equipping ourselves to be servants is still going to be necessary, just as it always has been. But we have new equipment to consider. We are a digital culture now. If we weren't before the pandemic, we are now. So how will churches embrace this new opportunity? Coming on campus is no longer a guest's first introduction to who a church is. If, and that's a big if, someone is searching for a church, they will visit the web page first. They aren't looking for a welcome loaf of bread and a coffee mug. That's not going to get them to return. No longer do people look to go to events on campus. We can no longer think in terms of how we attract people to us. We have to go to where the people already are. 
How can we be a church in the community rather than expecting the community to come to us? Lots of church programming used to depend on a stay-at-home parent who had lots of hours to volunteer at church. That's just not the case anymore in our culture. Volunteering is going to look different in 2021 than it did in 1980. How do we need to pivot? This is not the kind of equipping churches have done in the past, but we better start doing it. There's a pair of dice which are enshrined on a velvet pillow under glass in the Las Vegas Desert Inn. It seems that back in 1950, an anonymous sailor made 27 straight wins with the dice at a game of craps. I'm not a gambler, but I understand that's tough to do. In fact, one report says the odds against such a feat are 12,467,000 890 to 1. Here's what's interesting. Had the sailor bet the house limit on each roll, he would have earned $268 million. As it was, he was so timid with his wagers that he walked away from the table with only $750. God took a huge risk 2,000 years ago. He didn't just bet the house, he bet his life. He went to the cross for you and me, not knowing if we'd receive the gift or not. And after rising from the dead, he took another big risk when he entrusted this life-saving gift of ministry to us. We come here to get equipped for that job, for that ministry. But I fear that many of us Christians walk away at the end with only $750. We end up being too timid in our faith, not trusting our equipment, and as a result, end up depriving ourselves of the joy that come in taking big risks. We let opportunities go by to share our story and how God's story changed it. We let bad experiences shut us down and we withdraw. But what would happen if we really did keep taking risks? I think if I were pushed to condense my job into a simple summary statement, I might say something like, my job is to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, equip you to take some big risks for Jesus. My job is to equip you for a risk-taking faith. Anything which we can calculate out and plan for all the contingencies, anything that we can do on our own, doesn't require much faith. There's no risk. Harry Fosdick Emerson, who served as the pastor at Historic Riverside Presbyterian Church in New York City, is quoted saying, always take a job that is too big for you. If we never risk it, if jobs and ministry are always manageable, where's the room for God to work? I'm not going to be content with $750 worth of risk. Let's take the job that's too big for us. Let this be the equipment room for that kind of ministry. Amen. Please join me in this morning's prayers. God, the giver of all good gifts, we thank you for the way you pour out your gifts upon the church. Teach us to recognize the gifts in our neighbor. Empower us to build one another up and celebrate those gifts. And then equip us to use those gifts in service to you in the mission for which you've set us apart. Stir us to take risks, to attempt jobs too big for us. Increase in us our faith to know that you will fill any gap in which our attempts might fall short. We pray for our Vacation Bible School volunteers. Fill them with your love that knows no bounds. Make this a place where children discover more about your love for them. 
Thank you for each volunteer and each child whom you've called here this week. Continue to grow our ministries, especially to youth and families. Be at work with our call committee and their role discerning the next associate pastor you're calling to serve among us. Speak clearly so that it's obvious to them and us what your design is. We pray for those who are on our minds and hearts who need your healing and care. For six-year-old Mason and his parents, Tara and Mike, as they face Mason's leukemia and seek your healing. For Chiza, recovering from cataract surgery. For Steve, recovering from joint replacement. And all those we name silently before you now. We ask for the hope of resurrection to be made real for Teresa in hospice care. And we pray for any who grieve and feel the emptiness of a loved one's absence. I pray for an end to this COVID pandemic. We know that we have a role in this. Stir people to seek vaccination so that all in our community can be protected and a sense of normalcy can return safely to us all. Thank you for how you act through scientists and healthcare workers. May we see vaccines as your provision in our lives. Protect all who serve on the front lines and in hospitals facing surging COVID cases again. All this we ask for and whatever else you see we need in the name of Jesus, whose mission we continue to strive for. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Is there anybody sunshine? I've been turned to bay. Is it anyone's blue skies? I've been turned Turned out real bad Is anyone's happiness I turned outside I don't know I can trust in the things that I see